Uh, well, just, I thought after a while you get a bit bored of me, so a few pictures. <laughs> so, now I move back to Europe. I think, I want to put to you the case and think about it. And I think many people say it, and indeed the Burgermaster already uh, referred to it. So I can be quick on this. My main message is for this part of the talk is that the EU has failed to deliver where it should and made us to match where it should not. Uh, so, for example, there's this Irish guy. A few years ago, I, as a, well, not completely as a joke, because politics is never a joke, but I, I, I had some ambition as a younger man to be European Commissioner. Now, thank goodness they appointed Neely Cruz, who was very good. Uh, <laughs> but I must admit, when I see this guy called McCreevy, who was the successor of Fritz Bolkestein, is an Irishman, a very neoliberal Minister of Finance of Ireland, and he is uh, Neely's uh, colleague. He's dangerous. He should be hanged up by the balls from the ceiling and everybody should be able to throw darts at him. He's the biggest culprit in Europe. He's been saying the last four years I've been seeing him in the various debates, no, 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 there is no need for pan-European supervision. The market will sort it all out. So, and then, of course, now the G20 has said that Europe will take a leading role in having also European financial regulation. And now she's, oh, yeah, no, now we do it, of course. But the guy, Europe, has failed to deliver. They've been against it. They've been pulling the car backwards rather than pulling the car forwards. And they've got a disgraceful track record on that. Europe has not been, has been not absent, but too absent. We remember this lovely man who you probably never heard of, but he was a colleague of us, Gijs de Vries. Has any of you heard of Gijs de Vries? He looks like a colonial administrator. <laughs> uh, but a lovely man, married with an English wife, and one of the nicest favorite days I know. And he was made big European job. The job anybody, uh, Gert would, you, you would be the ideal man for it. <laughs> you know, I'm not trying to get you away from us there, but, I mean, but, but it's, it was the anti-terrorist tsar of Europe. Well, it was a complete failure. Because he couldn't get the information from all these intelligence officers from all around Europe. We couldn't even get together an information sharing system at a pan-European level. He looked completely ridiculous. And that was what, so Gijs eventually handed back his portfolio and said, forget it. Uh, I already talked about former Yugoslavia and what I feel was a big disgrace. Uh, but of course I have responsibility as well in, the, in an implied way. Climate change, we're not doing enough. So there Europe could have taken on all these things, could have taken a more forceful quantity. These are also things immigration, and terrorism climate change, which are by nature political. These are political topics. People disagree on whether you should do something about the climate or not, or about migration or not. So how come that Europe is unable? Europe is no longer about one currency or one market. Europe is about these topics, about financial supervision, about climate change, about pollution, about terrorism, about migration. These are all inherently European topics which cannot be dealt with at the national level, must be dealt with at the supranational level, preferably the global level, failing that at the European level. And how come we should ask ourselves also as a political caste that we are unable to make that exciting and to make that kind of, uh, uh, you know, that everybody talks about it. At the same time, this is a bit uh, facetious of me, uh, I personally think a bit more than my own political party. I, I've been Minister of Culture, or what they call the Minister in Europe, but it's I'm not sure whether, if I, okay, one little thing. Uh, European cultural budget, 80%, 70% of the money goes on overhead. Do I need to say more? Uh, I think not. Uh, culture, a lot of the subsidiarity principle, which many of you have been studying, says that it should be put at the lowest possible level. And if there are many taste differences in culture, it's typically where there are taste differences, it should be done at a local level, not at a pan-national pan level. If there is a taste difference in, Europe, in Holland for working very short hours, for having holidays all the time and having a relaxed lifestyle, then I don't want Europe to tell us that that's wrong. That's our prerogative. But the second bullet, these are all pan-European prerogatives. So I'm saying that the more you make the set of tasks for Europe more compact and more political, then it's easier to make Europe a more uh, a, a project. Now, I'm coming to an end. Political spectrum. So, left and right. Well, uh, left and right. And then there's something in the middle. But it's a bit like that. The left and right wing 
left and right-wing populists are doing very well. And these regular parties, they're all shitholes. They're not doing very well. So why is that? Uh, it's strange because most European citizens, we have lots of surveys, detailed surveys, detailed polls all over Europe. And then even these funny Swedes, they all support standard fiscal federalism arguments. So, so they realize that Europe is important. Uh, what people do get peeved off about, that the violation of the subsidiarity principle, the ones I just talked about, really has undermined support for the European project. So all this stuff I talked about here, we know from surveys, which I haven't got time to talk with you about, that people really, that is really contributing to the democratic deficit, is really contributing to people losing interest in the European project. We know that from detailed survey evidence. But, but throughout Europe, Euroscepticism is fueled by the rise of populist left-wing parties, think in the Netherlands Socialist Party. They oppose neoliberal reforms. That's how, they, that's how part of the, the nay vote was. Uh, they said it's all neoliberal project, it's one currency, one market, they're all bastards, it's bad for the poor people. That's, that's the rhetoric they had. And then on the other hand, you had these right-wing parties like Fortuyn and others who defend national sovereign, sovereignty and, and identity. And, and it was those who were really cannibalizing the support for the European project. Think carefully about the causation. It's not those parties that are causing the anti-European sentiment. <laughs> it's the anti-European sentiment that's causing the rise of these parties. <coughs> Be very careful. I mean, don't, or at least leave open the possibility which way it goes. I think it is extreme parties benefit from the anti-European sentiment. And there is, may I say, light econometric evidence for that. And I, 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 but I, let me tell, let me put this is my feeling. I, I, because the research I've seen for that is weak, I feel. But I think, I want to believe that. So here you have some of these parties. So the, the right-wing parties, you have the Freilige Partij in Oostenrijk, of course the Vlaams Blok, the Danske Volkerpartij, the Front National, the Lega Noord, Gwilders, I should not forget. Funnily enough, the Conservative Party is, uh, is in all this research, always comes out there. And on the left wing, you have the Socialist Partij, we have the Venstre Partiet in Sweden, and the Milieu Partiet de Corona, that's the ones I know. Ireland, very famous, the Sinn Féin and the, and the Green Party. It's those parties which are doing very well. So uh, this gentleman is also doing quite well, uh, uh, and he's then one of the right wing guys. But he is, I, I put him down here, this young man, because he is not, he's not just a Dutch phenomenon. It's a phenomenon we see throughout Europe, uh, not just Austria and Denmark. There are other Geert Wilders around, maybe not such a nice haircut, but they are around. So, so the old argument in the favor of the EU, I've already said in the beginning, failed to impress. So actually, in fact, they turn around. So if you now look at trying to understand why people vote certain things, we have what they call well, detailed panel data studies for those who have studied social or but, but, but let me try to give you the result of that. What we find that those people who are worried about an exclusive national identity, Limburgers, uh, or about economic anxiety, the anxiety of becoming unemployed or disabled, uh, and particularly a dissatisfaction with national democracies, all of these contribute to Eurosceptic sentiments and can be cued by populist parties. So, so read what I said. They can be cued by populist parties. That's why the causation goes the other way around. The old arguments in favor of the EU, never war again, they, they don't really work anymore. That turns out at the research. They fail to impress pop, populist parties, and they also many young Europeans. A little wider away, I think, a cordon, a cordon sanitaire, which you've seen in the Flemish uh, part of uh, Europe and sometimes talked about in the Netherlands. Uh, I think will be counterproductive, but that's a separate discussion. So the, what we also see from these studies, that there is a class thing. I'm uh, very lucky to be in, in Nuffield as well in, in Oxford, and there's a guy called Goldthorpe, who is one of the most eminent sociologists uh, of, of, in his life. I mean, he's a very good guy. And we talk a lot about class and status. In Britain, class is not the same thing as status. Maybe you know this guy called Prescott. He's this big fuck, and he's kind of the deputy prime minister, and he's a big working class man. He's really pissed off because he will never be upper class. He may be deputy prime minister, but in England, you can be working class. I suppose Ruth 